Hello, everybody, and welcome to Out Comes the Sun Radio with my amazing co-host and best friend, Melissa Yamaguchi, Woo-hoo. who has finally reached my decade. We won't talk about it. But anyway, very glad that that happened quite We can recently. talk about it any time. I am very happy. I'm oh, very proud. Funny. I had somebody I, call me I, recently I, and said, poor thing, now you're 60. How does it feel? And I said, so glad I made it. So glad I've been able. I know many people in my life who have passed away much younger. So I am very grateful for every step I take. I know. Well, you're, you're it, 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 I have to say that you're, I mean, you, maybe you're going to talk about this. I, I don't know, but your daughter, who I think is amazing anyway, you're both your kids, but she created a video for you. So they asked me to do a little video and I almost, I, I did it a couple of times and I was crying and it was stupid for I was crying. <laughs> I bet you were. Oh well, my, my gosh. I can my daughter it. put together a 45 minute video of friends of wow. mine and family that she had reached out to as far back as grade school, college, oh, high school, wow. business world that I haven't seen in 20 years. And every and they everybody came forward and made a little one to two minute video saying something either. And her request was either a funny anecdote about my mom or the revealing of a story that matters to you. And so every time somebody's face would come on, I'd scream, Mariel! And then I'd <laughs> listen to what you had to say and I'd cry. And then the next, oh, Jill! And I, so I, I was a, I was a mess. I may have aged three years from the stress of crying so much. <laughs> oh no, that's amazing. It well, was lovely. It was lovely. Deserved every bit of it. Anyway, so belated happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I am. I want to tell you something. I was I was reading some news this morning and I I came across something that I found pretty interesting. Um, Scientists have been talking about behavioral scientists, neuroscientists have been talking about ways to help children when they're grumpy, which might be a cool trick for you to have now that you're a a grandmama Uh and your daughter has a little baby. And it may be too late to do it with our grown children, maybe not. But when a child is grumpy, oftentimes we try to speak to them and tell me how you're feeling and what are you thinking and why are you mad and are you are you sad? Are you mad? Tell me how you're feeling. And and they're discovering that that's not nearly as effective as just holding them and lightly caressing their back or their scalp with your fingertips, just a real gentle rub. It's that it releases endorphins. Neuroscientists are saying that it allows, you know, we all crave human touch. It allows the, them to calm down. And so, and it's it's interesting because in different cultures, they they cover this. And one of the, so in in Korea, it's known as Yakson. In, in New Delhi, it's called Malish. And then in Latin America, it's called Piojitos. So if you give piojitos, it's mean you're massaging lightly across the back with your fingertips. Um, and it, it gives them like, you know, goosebumps or chicken skin, what some people call it. And so you're just, when, that, uh, when that's happening, it allows the, their emotions to completely quell. Isn't that fascinating? Oh, that's I think amazing. if you tried to do that to Bobby, he might get upset. <laughs> no, Bobby would love that. But Bobby children, you know, that. he's such a little kid. He comes in. At night, he wants me to, you know, like massage his head and not say a word. It's interesting. He's very much like a little kid. I'm going to use it on him. <laughs> piojitos, piojito time, mijo, piojitos. Mijo. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That's so cool. I'm discovering, you know, being a new grandmother, it's kind of like becoming a mother again. Um, but I look at all those sites on you know, child rear. I have it all sent. I, of course, send, you know, I send the a message to Dree all the time, but I look at them myself and, you know, the way that they are communicating nowadays, as opposed to how it was <laughs> when I was raising my girls, it's different. You know, it's different. It's certainly different than how we were raised. You know, there was, there was very little communication, but I like the idea that sometimes it's not what you say, it's that it's what you do, you know, yep. and, and yep. stroking them and that physical connection, you know, watching Dree, cause she's really is an extraordinary mother. I'm like really kind of amazed, but she, that baby is so connected to her. I mean, yes, the baby's only seven months old. And so of course they're, they're, 
you know, they're bonded. I mean, I'm sure that uh, Luce, my granddaughter, still feels she's a part of her mother's body, right? She's, a, but they're, she, it, 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 and her, her partner, uh, Nick, always says, look, there's a certain time of the day from like, I don't know what it is, 4 p.m. to 7 when she goes to sleep at night, where only Dree has the ability to, you know, to soothe her, you yeah. know, otherwise she'll cry. But she doesn't cry with Dree. It's just, um, it, it, it's kind of amazing. She's like this magnet of... Yes, I know she's nursing and all that stuff and, and she won't take a bottle and do all this stuff. But, you know, they figured out their situation. It works brilliantly. You know, it, it, it's it's beautiful to watch because I think I was more um, structured in how I raised them because I thought that that's what you were supposed to do. I don't know. Well, I think also that this, this generation, um, and I say this generation, childbearing years, which, you know, I'm not going to push it and say 40. I, let me let me say maybe you're like 38, 40 and, and younger when they're they grew up in more of a digital world. Yeah. So the access is different, but also yeah. they as youngsters and in their 20s, when they were more influenced by digital than maybe in their 30s. And then the, certainly the 20 year olds and younger, heavily influenced by digital age. I like the fact that these scientists are saying, look, look touch your child because in a world of digital words have different meanings and so when someone print a text on social media you know you're gross turn nobody wants to watch your page or whatever people put on these what do these jerks put on the page words have words they teach themselves that it's only words right sticks and stones can break my bones right so they they've learned to kind of numb it and the fact that we're reverting I don't know if reverting is the right word, that they're highlighting the importance of this tactile process of touching. It's, I think it's powerful. It's smart. And the timing, it's necessary. It's really necessary. Absolutely. We've lost touch with each other, literally. Well, you know what Bobby says about uh, about texting, that it's a it's maybe, a, maybe a 7% connection, 7%. Of all the connection of of a hundred percent, that's seven percent. That's nothing. That's nothing. Yeah. So you know, our dialogue. I mean, thank God we can do this on Zoom, FaceTime, whatever, and I can see your face, and you can yeah. react to my face, and we're having a dialogue that is uh, interactive, and even the phone is that much better. Yeah. But in person, that tactile, Come on. You know, that's why people suffered so much during COVID is, is people, there was Absolutely. no physical contact and it was it, it more so than germs and bacteria. I mean, not more so, but you know what I'm saying? It yeah. had a profound effect on our Absolutely. As a community. It's but I got to tell you, 7% is still higher than the, than the communication I had with my ex-boyfriend. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> and that was back in the day that was before that was that was uh let's see how old am i yeah that was over 30 years ago wow communication That's we were just like we were like the the uh the tin man no the straw man on the wizard of oz just like missing each other every yeah you know. <laughs> so wild that's crazy yeah you know it's all it's all falling apart <laughs> anyway oh my gosh oh so excited so excited about our next guest yes um i should tell you a little bit about her because she's uh she's very cool her name is nikki mark and she lost a son heartbreaking story and um she lost her son like out of the blue yeah no cause no they couldn't figure out why he just literally went to bed one night when he was 12 years old and didn't wake up. So you want to stick around for this part of our show because it is going to blow your mind as it did mine. So stick around because we've got an amazing guest. Her name is Nikki Mark and uh, stay where you are. Come back. As a mental health advocate and author, I love books. Books have the capacity to inspire, educate, transform, and ultimately help readers all over the world. So if you wanna publish your book or if you need help writing your story, I highly recommend 
Mindstir Media, rated the number one best book publisher around the country. Mindstir Media can help you no matter where you are in the book writing or publishing process. Go to mindstermedia.com to learn more and schedule a consultation. Well, welcome back, everybody. And we have oh, such a great guest today. It's actually, it's going to be hard. I, I'm I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about you later uh, because it's just actually overwhelming what you've been through. I mean, having lost a son five years ago and deciding, you and your husband deciding that it wasn't going to be like something you were going to make take you down you were going to turn it into something powerful and 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 you have i mean maybe explain to our audience a little bit about what happened it, as long as that's cool with you and it doesn't uh trigger or something yeah no i'm i'm good um <laughs> My son, Tommy, went to sleep one night and didn't wake up. And um, it's, you know, an unfathomable moment that is indescribable. So I won't even try. But what I will say is in that moment, I completely broke open. Um, he and I had, had a conversation three days prior. I was, he was a soccer player and I took him to his soccer match. We were in a car for two hours, which is very typical in Los Angeles. And <laughs> he asked me if it was possible to go to sleep and not wake up. And I looked at him and I said, well, if you're like 85 years old, like your grandmother. And I told him, you know, that's the best way to go when you're older because, you know, no pain, no drama, just that's such a great way to go. And then he said a couple minutes later, you know, it must be really hard for a parent to lose a child. And I looked at him and I thought, what is happening here? We were not religious people, nor were we very you know, spiritual. We really never talked about God or life and death. And I looked at him and I said, that's not going to happen here. I'm the mother. I'm your parent. I will go first. And we proceeded to talk about all the signs I would give him when I left. And when we had this amazing conversation, I described how much I loved him, why I was so proud of him. I reviewed his whole life with him. And the whole time I was thinking, what is wrong with me? This is not the mother that I am. I must be getting really sensitive. He's turning 13 in a few weeks. Cut to three days later, he went to sleep and didn't wake up. And in that moment, I was devastated on the one hand. And on the other hand, I broke open. I started to see and hear and feel things I never had before. And I felt like this is some sort of plan. I don't really understand. It seems mystical. It seemed like he and I were having one conversation, but maybe on some spiritual or soul level, we were having another. And I decided in my worst hour that I would wake up every day to honor him, to honor him in his world and to live for my younger son who is still in this world and deserves a mother and a beautiful life. And so I embarked on a journey of figuring out how can you heal a mother's broken heart? And one way was to serve. And my husband and our family and our community committed to sharing Tommy's spirit of play with the world um, and brightening um, all of you know the city he loved, the neighborhood he loved by building a, an athletic field for children to play on called Tommy's Field. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I know. That right? was the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. So explain Tommy's feel. It's because he was a soccer player, correct? And he was a soccer player. He was an athlete. He was, when I say play, I mean, this is a kid. When he left, I knew immediately, oh gosh, he showed me how to do it. Like how to really live every minute of your life. And he was always singing and dancing and smiling and playing. And I think that's why his community was so large and diverse and it really taught me that I needed to learn how to play again, that as an adult, we forget, you know, you become so busy being responsible, but really when that day comes and you're going to exit this world, you really, I know now you look back and you think, but did I enjoy it? Yeah. 
Right. And did I do the things I wanted to do? Because I learned in that moment, my list, my checklist, all the busyness of being a mom, like none of that mattered anymore. And this child's life was showing me play. And so we built this field. I actually told him in that car ride, he said, what are you going to do for your next job, mom? I, I had done a number of startups in Los Angeles and I had taken a few months off. And I said, I don't know, but I want it to be meaningful. And I think I might build a a refurbish a dirt field in a park for kids to play on. And he's like, oh, I love that idea. I can't wait to play on it. And so, you know, that day he left, a friend said, let's still build that field. Let's honor his spirit of play. Let's share it with others. People want to pour their hearts into something and let's put it in this field. And so it became a really beautiful and tragic uh, mission that year to raise the money. It was over a million dollars to refurbish this dirt field with holes in a public park. And I saw it in my mind. Like I saw the field, I saw kids playing on it. I saw the sign and I called the city of LA and I said, we'll raise the money. I don't know how, but we'll raise the money. And we can we call it Tommy's field? And they said, yes. And so everybody came out of Tommy's community, our family's community, kids sold lemonade, they gave their birthday party money away. Um, some people, we held, they held a concert for us, certain artists came out, comedians came out. I mean, it was really, like I said, tragically beautiful, because we asked for none of it. And everyone just showed up to support and grieve together as a community. And it taught me how important community is. And it reminded me what my son's life was teaching me, which is that the relationships and the friendships and the family and enjoying this lifetime, like at the end of the day, that's what it's about. And so we raised the money and yes, we embarked, you know, we, we were confronted with some local politics that I didn't expect, but in the end, the field got built. Tommy's field is in Westwood park and it is such a success. Kids, adults, professional players, all types of sports are played on it for soccer to football. And, you know, that was our first field. And we've since done a second and now we're in discussions for a third. That's amazing. I have a question for you. Did it, did his passing and all of the kind of unbelievable circumstances prior to him passing him, you know, like actually preparing you, has it changed your spiritual outlook? Are you a more spiritual person, a different? Do you, what, is that an odd question to ask? Oh, I am so different. I, I always believed in something more. I didn't know what, and I certainly didn't take the time to figure it out. In fact, I would read, try and read books. Um, like bestsellers written by very thoughtful and profound thinkers. <laughs> and after a couple of chapters, I would literally toss them aside and be like, what are they saying? I don't <laughs> understand. And then after, <laughs> yeah, I really, and then after Tommy passed away, I was posed with the question, what do you believe about life and death? And I thought to myself, I have no idea, but I'm hearing things and I'm feeling things in a new way. And my vision is different. And my dreams were going crazy. And I was starting to see symbols and visits of people. And I didn't understand. And so I took a very deep dive into what life and death could mean. And I am definitely on a spiritual pathway because one, I have no, I had no choice. I broke open, my senses changed. And it's just sort of the way I see life now is so much more. In fact, I feel so connected to Tommy and my son every day that I believe we're learning and growing together. Do you do you feel a connect? I mean, do you feel oh, like yeah. he talks to you? I'm sure that you do. In my dreams, I've right. had him give me advice. Oh. I have uh, seen him just smiling and waving. <laughs> passing through I call on him all the time um I when I, I write and so I feel this like I feel him like through me um yeah. so you know and so it's I'd give it all away you know obviously to have him here right next to me and as someone who um worked for startups and did very difficult projects in my life and always, you know, used to say to Tommy, 
nothing's impossible. Um, you know, I learned that bringing him physically back was something I couldn't fix, that that was impossible, but that the possibilities of connecting with the human spirit, that might be possible. And I would spend my life trying. And so I may, I, it gives me a lot of peace um, to stay connected in that way and use it for this world though, not to escape this world. Right. I have a life here. I feel like we have a plan. I feel like we're doing stuff together. I have a younger son and I just want to have the best life that we can create. So it, when my end of day comes, I don't look back and I say, okay, you taught me and I did it. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. When, when this, um, first of all, thank you for sharing your story with us and our audience. Um, it's not a story that anyone wants to have the the quill poised to write so i i'm sorry for your loss it's it's tragic and i've been choking the whole time choking back so if i break open here myself and burst into tears i'll ask you and our audience to please forgive me um when you were going through this process it seems as though you and tommy had been having a, this, a, this mystical conversation that at the time you weren't able to make the connection to so that soon after his passing or not soon or so, time is relative at some point after tommy's passing you were able to say your friend stepped in let's do the field keep moving so you had purpose when you speak with other parents what advice do you have nikki in in learning how to balance the honoring the child or the loved one who passed while maintaining their own sense of well-being and staying present, how do you find that balance? My first, the first thing I do is I tell them my story because I want them to know how awful it was. I didn't know if I'd make it. I thought I'd die. I wanted to die. I, I just didn't know how it was possible to survive this kind of loss and actually rebuild. And I think because I was in the startup world, I had the tools to restart myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how I did, but like at a startup, you don't know how you just have a vision. Um, right. And so I often start with just telling my story to give them hope. You just need hope to right. start. And yeah. the other thing I did initially is I told people what I needed. And I was a very private person before. And I got a very quick download. You know, it's not just about me that people don't know how to help me. I knew I didn't know how to help myself. I wouldn't have known how to help someone else. So I got very honest. People asked, what can I do? I would tell them. And they were very appreciative and they kept coming. So everyone kind of took on different roles based on what I told them. Some were just the ones who showed up to walk with me. Some were the ones to sit and say nothing with me. You know, everyone asked in a different way and I, I gave the answer based on who they were and what they wanted to offer. And the truth is I told everyone like, you're all welcome here. I need you all. <laughs> like, oh, absolutely. And, and so being honest about what you need. Um, and I know other parents who have lost a child who were very um, open and outgoing and did the opposite. They needed more time to themselves. You know, we all react differently. So I always sit with people. I tell them my story to give them hope. I remind them to be honest with themselves about what they need to just grieve during this time. I have personally found it better to feel every ounce of it and get through it than numb it or avoid it or stuff it because it will just keep coming out in different ways. It comes out anyway, um, but just like don't prolong the pain and the suffering because we can honor the people we lose. They're still our family. And when we honor them, even though it starts like we're honoring them and living for them, it truly becomes that we're also doing it for ourselves and for the people around us here. And so I look at it like, love is what motivates me the deepest love possible that I never even allowed myself to feel before that's so on the verge of painful but yet so beautiful and that is the love that gets me out of bed every day to be 
the person I want to be and to honor that child I lost by sharing something he loved so much with the world. I think that's why he came and to, you know, be here and be the best mom I can be for my younger son. So how old is he? How old is he? He's 15 now. He was 10 at the time. And Tommy was his idol, his best friend, you know, his older brother. And so that is, you know, it's definitely a challenge because siblings, there's not a lot of support, you know, for siblings. I, not a lot of friends asking you every day, how can I help you? That's a whole nother topic, but I would say, I mean, uh, we often talk about, we talk about mental health, which this is so relevant. This is all about mental health. It's all about telling your story, but, you know, people, we forget that you know, loss happens to every, you know, it happens all around you. It happens to everyone. And it's sometimes it's not knowing what you need, knowing that you need help, but you don't even know what that help is. Right. At some level. Yeah. And you know, my, my brain went offline and you know, I'm pretty well educated. I have a MBA, you know, I did all the right things growing up. I could check those boxes. And when this happened, the shock and the grief, I mean, my brain froze for a good year and I had to live with my heart. And I realized, oh, my brain was so overdeveloped and my heart was so buried. I mean, I was a nice person, but it definitely didn't guide my decision-making throughout my day, the choices that I made, how I spent my time, the smile on my face, how I used it. And so this became a journey of living with my heart and learning it, like what it was all about. Like that, you know, when they say, who are you? You realize in those moments, oh, I have no idea. Right. No idea. It's a clean slate. And now who do I want to be? Who can I be? And you start over because you, you just can't band-aid it. You, you kind of start over. Do you have rituals that you practice on a daily basis that provide you comfort? I was so desperate. I turned to meditation and, you know, the old me would have <laughs> never made it through a few minutes. I do it every day now and I do breath work. Um, I go to sound baths, I do some quiet meditation, but for the most part, it's active. And I believe that helped me a lot. Um, I, I have rituals of lighting a candle, I write every day. To my son, actually, someone left me a journal, and I um, saw it in a pile of condolence cards, and I pulled it out, and I just started writing, and I started writing to him. And now every night before bed, I write to him you know, a page or two, whatever comes out, just how was your day? Here was mine. And on the one hand, I'm like, I think, you know, all this, but on the other hand, I'm not sure. <laughs> so <laughs> it's all crazy, but it really does connect me. Um, Absolutely. Hey, uh, you know, what's so extraordinary about listening to you. And I'm sure that Melissa, you feel this, I'm so overwhelmed emotionally. I don't, and it's not just because of the loss. It's because of who you've become. Because you can feel, and I'm sure all everybody who's listening can feel who you are. Like it just comes through. Like your journey is so, it's tangible. It's very like you can feel it. I don't know. I'm well, like you know. You said something a while ago about maybe this is why he came, and we look for purpose in our lives always, and to realize as a as a fellow mother to realize that you you and your son continue to have this connection which fuels purpose and there are so many of us that will slide into our coffin one day or the urn whichever way we go and really still be grumbling about taxes on the way out and so we don't have we've not found any kind of reason what's the reason and and i will share with you as i've shared on the show before that i suffered through seven miscarriages before i had my two children and i I went through a really numb phase where I really wasn't sure what the heck was going on and knew I'd be a good mom. I knew a lot of girlfriends that I have who would get pregnant and then complain that their hips were wider or whatever. They were complaining. I'd say, 
if only, you know, if only. And then, then you, then I have my two much later in life. And then I think, okay, this is why I had, that's just why I had to go through what I went through selfishly to maybe these two, this is why I'm here. And to hear you talk about this with your connection to your son and connection to still, still working through everything. And I'm sure you still have moments where your breath is taken away that I don't think that ever changes, but to realize you have that. And it's something that you are dedicated to on a daily basis to like that, that daily writing in the journal is massive. And I, that's one thing I really want our audience to listen to, because I, I went through phases of that when I, but mine were angry. So I think if, 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 if I had to return that book to the library in heaven and got, if there is a heaven, I, they'd look at that and go, get to the back of the line, lady, you're too angry and you're refigure this out and come back as a cricket. I don't know what would happen to me, but <laughs> you realizing that you're going through this writing and still going through the process is so huge. It's a, that's a massive tool. It really is. Yeah. You know, I also learned that. I had great, great grandparents who lost a son at 12 years old. Oh, really? I learned. And so when Tommy left, oh my God, I thought back to the conversation we had driving to his soccer match. But I also thought back to my great, great grandparents who lost a son at 12 years old, like that, like unexpectedly like that. And I stopped and I said, wait a minute, this, what is this now? Yeah. And I, started to believe without having any spiritual background or any understanding of different healing modalities that there was some kind of cycle in my family and yeah. a cycle of loss. And somehow it made its way to me. And what was my part in this? So my healing became so much bigger than me. Yeah. It became about my whole family line going backwards maybe but definitely going forwards and what can I do in this lifetime to make sure no one in my family loses a child like this ever again and if if I can do that yeah you know, that is my biggest purpose and so by healing my own heart I believe and by you know serving the world and serving others with play yeah. because that's what brightens all of us um, that I can potentially achieve that for my family. And I look at everybody has wounds and traumas and cycles in their families, Yes, whether it's divorce, whether it's abuse, whatever it may be, mental illness, you know, suicide, we all have wounds. And I've learned that if we can heal our hearts and begin healing our hearts, I mean, it's kind of never ending in layers, but when we can start to heal our own hearts, we start to see the world shift around us. Absolutely. And that's how we heal. Absolutely. You know, and you know, you know, you've said something so profound about really, if we heal the family trauma, and that's just healing your, that's just going in and looking inside and doing the work yourself because you do get to, you get, you, what you've done is heal generations to come. You know, yeah. you've healed your son. He doesn't have to have that it, because it's also not knowing I came from that. I came from a very similar kind of legacy of suicides and mental illness and all that stuff. And I was so fearful of it that I ignored it for many years until I couldn't ignore it any longer. And then you're like, either I do something about this in myself and that healing that heals your family. So good on you for what you've done, because that is, it's, it's just commendable. It's commendable. And it's so wonderful that you, that really the healing is, is play. play. Because what, what, you know, Bobby and I, my, he's my, I'll call him my husband. Um, uh, he's, he's my partner. But uh, we were talking about it this morning because we we do health and wellness stuff. And he's always talking about longevity. And the key to longevity is to stay a child, yeah. is to stay a kid, to play, to laugh, to engage, to be so present in that joy. And, and that's what you've done against 
the pain, you know, up against the pain of, of what you had to go through. So like, it's like trudging through that to come to the other side. It's like the lotus flower and the muck coming, you know, and revealing its beauty through, you know, through the, the ugly, whatever. Yeah. I mean, I remember the first time I smiled and the first time I laughed after Tommy left and I was like, whoa, this, oh, I mean, you're so, I was so confused and all, and then I heard, but to laugh is to honor him. He laughed more than anyone. And so he smiled more than anyone. He played more than anyone. He was always, so it, you know, when playing is free. <laughs> like we all have different <laughs> forms of playing and people all want to help make our world a brighter place. And if we all just played a little more in whatever way we find enjoyable, it'll, it'll bring some lightness to the world for sure. That's what I have found. And it's, it's helped me heal. Yeah. I mean, to remind myself every day to do something I find playful and um, healing and fun is super important, it has been a big part of my journey. Wow. Melissa. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm just, I'm taking it all in. Well, I know. I need to know. I, I, your, your evolution through this grieving process, when you're, when you're working with other people, because I took the liberty of getting on and reading some of your articles on your blog site. I looked on your Instagram page and we want our audience to go through and look and find you on Instagram, Facebook, all of your different locations, because you have some, you, your writing is really good and very, you capture you capture the essence of everything that you're, you're going through with your writing. So it's, I, I went through and read and I was realizing that your evolution through this, and I didn't go back too far, um, but when I was looking through this, your evolution of, the, of what you've written and what you've gone through, even on your Instagram page, I went pretty far back and I didn't like them because it's always kind of creepy when someone goes years back on your Instagram page. Why are you liking from something from 2020? But I was going back and reading everything that you'd been posting so I could be better equipped to meet you today. And I was watching this evolution of everything you've gone through. So my question is, when you're working with other people, it seems as though you've made this very smooth transition. And I know that you spoke in the very beginning of our conversation today about the pain and about how you were very honest and real, like, come walk with me, sit with me, just come. I, well, the door's open to the tribe, everybody get in here. <clears throat> and a lot of people do have trouble. Like you said, some people just need to be left alone, depends on each person. So you, I'm sure one of your encouragements is for everybody to honor where he or she is standing at the moment. <clears throat> My my question is, when you're working with other people and they feel like it's so daunting that they want to give up on life themselves, even though they do have other children or not, even though they do have a, a mate or not, whatever the situation is, what's one, what, what do you say, Nikki? What, what, I, cause I feel, I feel that it would be, that's such a heavy push to give someone when it's hard to, t to tell them about hope when at the moment they don't even know how to spell it. You know, I I just tell them my story because I want them to know if I can do this, they can do this. Yeah. It's other people's stories that have helped me. I'm not a, like a teacher, like a professional teacher or guru right. or healer. I can only share my story and all that I've learned and put it in human terms. So like I said before, I would read all those books and be like, what are they talking about? Well, after Tommy passed, I knew exactly what they were talking about. I mean, I could write the book within 30 yeah. seconds, right? And so, but I, I was upset because I realized, why don't we learn any of this stuff earlier in life? And why doesn't anyone explain it to us in a human way we can understand? And so in my writing, in my blogs, I keep them simple, but within them is weaved all this research and everything I've experienced because I want people to feel the information and I want them to like download just a dose of like magic to help get them through their day. The truth is it's, you know, I tell people community, Yep. Give you the energy you need when you don't have it. I mean, you don't even realize when you're so dark. That's right. You don't know which way to go and you just want to die. How, nothing anyone says can help you. Right. right. Nothing. But the energy of being with people just around you is enough sometimes to keep you lifted. Mm -hmm. um, and, for, you know, I got lost in my writing. It was the only thing I could do 
that would get me from one second to the next where I wasn't thinking about how much I wanted to die. Right. Um, and so it was really just be honest, just be open, grieve. And yet I would tell my story because I would always end with, and I do always end with, if I could do this, you could do this. And we can do this together. You That's- said something in the, just a few seconds ago, you said, why didn't anyone talk to us about this? And I was speaking with an author on Saturday who was talking to me about death in, a, in other cultures and how every other culture has this process. My husband is half Japanese, half Portuguese. And in Japan, the, the culture around dying and honoring those who have passed and the rituals that you go through are very specific. And you learn them in, in what we would equate to kindergarten. The little children are learning. They go to the cemeteries and they sweep and they put their little kerchiefs on and they there's nothing to be afraid of. This is a beautiful time when we honor our ancestors and very a lot of cultures have that and we are um, woefully remiss in not helping people understand understand that aspect of this journey. Life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nikki, I I want everybody who's listening to go to if you are an Instagram person, go to healing with Nikki. And that's N-I-K-K-I, it's Nikki Mark, but N-I-K-K-I, Healing with Nikki. And it really is a wonderful, you you have some wonderful videos and things and you share things that really are poignant. And, and if we've gotten anything out of it, your story is, is just so deep and so powerful. And yet you say it with such simplicity and and grace. And and we thank you so much for, you know, joining us today and and telling us a little bit about what you what you've been through and and how you share that and and how you tell your story because it's 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 beautiful and amazing. And we're gosh, we're just blessed to have you as a guest. And I, you know, I, I wish you so much success with. Uh, Tommy's Field, which I think is such a, a, a great way to honor him through laughter, through play, through finding your joy, through finding your spirituality when you didn't know you even had it. You know, I mean, there's so many, there's so many takeaways from from speaking with you. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you know, I'd love to talk to you again, but you know, there you go. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I love being able to just share my story and helping those who need it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Hi, my name is Ashley Avis. I'm the writer and director of Disney's Black Beauty, starring Kate Winslet and Mackenzie Foy, as well as the new documentary, Wild Beauty, Mustang Spirit of the West, which is a merger between the beauty of wild horses and a journalistic expose into the corruption befalling them. I'm also the founder and president of the Wild Beauty Foundation, which is wildbeautyfoundation.org. And you're listening to Out Comes the Sun with Marielle Hemingway and Melissa Yamaguchi. That just blew my mind. I I mean, the fact that she had premonitions with her son. It just, I mean, her son talking to her, that just, I, I don't, my heart just broke open at that moment. I, I, I don't know. Wow. I don't know. <laughs> I think my biggest, my biggest un- confusion, um, anybody who can navigate his or her way through something so tragic it's one thing and i don't say this with lightness in my voice it's one thing to lose a peer in age someone mildly younger in age a parent an older friend a parent person your age to lose a child is is so traumatic and it seems like such an abrupt and unfair ending um, without the person having being able to go through what we consider all the different rites of passage in life so to watch her, to listen to her, and since we're also doing this recording it, to watch her, the grace with which she speaks and the ease with which she communicates, to realize that she has gone through something so dramatically tragic um, and been able to, I know it's been five years, but I don't think it could be 50 and it would be any different. You know, there are women in their 80s who can tell you the time their babies were born because there's a, it's an imprint on your life. So five years she's moved through it with some grace but because she's kept herself busy and she has family but to listen to her talk about how her younger son 
really became very spiritual and tuned into this is what's taking place and i'm i'm witnessing this in my dreams and then which allowed that portal to open for her and her keeping an open heart and an open mind in spite of what she may have heard through life or not believed or was unaware of her having that open portal to her her heart and her soul and her mind has allowed her to really evolve to a level that I don't even think she probably knew that she could reach. No, I, I, absolutely. So if if you you all di probably didn't hear this part of the conversation, but we were, uh, uh, we, we spoke to her just as she was leaving, and and she said that her son was actually the person whose heart opened up before hers did actually that he was getting messages in his dreams. So. Wow. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's truly extraordinary because, yeah, she wasn't a spiritual person. She didn't consider herself, you know, she didn't go to church. She didn't go to temple. She didn't go to the here, there or anywhere looking for God until this happened. And I, it's not like she went and looked for it. It came to her, you know, and these children of hers, one that left and one that stayed are, have become her teachers really. Don't you think? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because she, as she said in our conversation, that her son still comes to her and she sees him sometimes just waving. And it's just this confirmation that I'm still connected to you. We're still together. And, still and her other son said, said to her, you know, this is, this is what this means. You know, there is, you know, like he, he, she, he was getting messages in his dreams and would come tell her right. even at 10 years. Oh, the thing I wanted to share with the audience is that her, her son, her son, who is still alive, who's 15 now, when he was 10, one of the first things he said is, oh no, now, now I'm an only child and a lonely child and a, and a lonely child. I mean, whoa. <laughs> and I, she said something that made, that really helped me visualize it. She said, whereas before we were a square or a rectangle with four points, yes. not a triangle. And so all of us are trying to figure out how do you balance that? What is that? Now, well, that, you know, how do you, how do we navigate with that? That's a whole different set of understanding of who we are. You have an identifier. This is who we yeah. are. We are a family yeah. of. And when that shifts yeah. and changes, I mean, yeah. it's rough enough for people when their children leave the house and go off to college. Yeah. And now yeah. This is like because when that when the family dynamic literally changes, when it shifts from one, yeah, from one, like, you know, from one, what is that? Triangle or rectangle? From a square or rectangle, rectangle to a triangle, right. To a triangle. And it is very interesting because that dynamic, you forget that that dynamic is so, it's so ingrained in, in who you are. And her son must have been like, I, you know, he, his, his brother was his idol, his, yeah. you know, like, and she said he was his compass. So like for that whole thing just went, that's, there's the loss of that ability to negotiate your world now you have to negotiate it differently yes, so right. now he gets more attention but i was even thinking yes he gets more attention but also does he feel ever and i meant to ask this but i forgot to does he ever feel not not as special or you know what that's i right. mean it, you're, you're, it's right. tommy's field and it's tommy this that's right that's a great okay. question i he wish you that's feeling, a great but, question because i i thought i thought does he ever feel like he can't live up to because there's this yes. there's this that's there's that's this right. super energy that's placed around tommy and does he feel like he's somehow in the shadow which a second a, a younger brother or a younger sister often does yeah, of the same absolutely. sex, like brother to brother sister to sister you often yeah. feel like you can't measure up but yeah. she said she's she you know, I hate to speak about her in third person, but she's not here, but I, she seems to um, have a pretty good handle on the balance of all this. That's why I was fascinated by her rituals because she seems to have figured out with the guidance of both of her boys, as you said, that they're teaching her, that both of her boys are guiding her and she's really, she's finding that balance pretty, pretty gracefully and pretty uh, successfully. Absolutely. Well, that was an amazing show. I mean, that was just so mind blowing, actually. Um, wow. 
uh, uh, th thank you everybody for for listening to again that was nikki mark and what what a story she's doing something called tommy's field which is a soccer field where all kinds of sports are playing on that field and she's kind of she's a you know she's got a she's got a voice on so social media for this kind of thing and really a testament to telling your story and how important it is because i think once you share your story for those that have lost somebody um uh it's good to know that telling your story is very very important and you know and and loss doesn't come come with an expiration date or or anything else i mean it just it's an ongoing process and like she said you know the heart it's about healing your heart and that's forever. You know, that's always going to go on no matter what kind of family you come from. So anyway, that was cool. Everybody, thank you so much for listening to Outcomes of Sun radio podcast. We're on Dash, we're on Spotify, we're on YouTube, we're on Apple. I don't know where else we are, but I know we're somewhere. Um, <laughs> but make sure you listen and also remember that we do this because we have something called the Mariel Hemingway Foundation, which is a resource navigator for people with mental health health issues. And what we are trying to raise money, we are raising money for is to create this resource navigator to find solutions for people's mental health issues, no matter what they are, no matter where you are, uh, we want to be able to point you in the right direction. Um, so that's the dream. So just remember when you go to Mariel Hemingway Foundation.org, you're not gonna find you know, you're not gonna find that yet, but that's what we're working on uh creating in the very near future. That said, we'll see you next time. <laughs>